Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 116. A cheap pound, five UK dividend stocks to consider. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today we're going to talk about five companies in the UK which we are going to consider with the UK pound being so cheap. All that and more. See you on the inside. Yo, 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 European DJ. How are you today, buddy? Uh, really good. Um, actually, really looking forward for the topic of today. We don't, uh, in the last two, three years, had so many opportunities to benefit from the Brexit. And it seems really that now is the time. Yeah, we seem to get a lot of questions today around currency. We know all currencies seem to be quite, would you say, um, dropping or crashing or cheap or, and so on. So I thought with the pound so cheap, I think it's only only nice of us to share some companies we might actually look at over there because we, we we know in the us don't we in, in the us and we'll get into this a little bit more we have the dollar getting stronger and we're in price in, in dollar amounts everything seems cheaper but then we go and actually compare what we paid for it in euro and it turns out to be a, a little bit more expensive so maybe staying a little bit closer to home might uh might help, might help our conscious a little bit when we're dollar cost averaging into positions. But before that, some news of the week with one of our favorite companies, well, at least favorite to talk about companies on it. And I think I have to give you credit for this one. It's it's another CEO. Uh, he's not getting the chop. He's he's walking himself, but Unilever CEO, Alan, Alan Yopi is retiring at the end of next year. So we still have a good bit to go, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I think it's a British way of dealing with uh, internal issues. <laughs> yeah, it's really a gentleman approach to getting someone out. On the other end, we really don't know what the true motivation is, right? It might be that he feels like, you know, I've done my years, 35 years in, uh, in business. It's time for me to uh, be financially independent. I think you and I, have similar aspirations right so that could be one and i'm sure he is uh, already uh, uh, financially independent from that point of view maybe he has a lot of self-awareness and feels like this job is maybe a bit too difficult for me because when i saw interviews of him when he was um, dealing with investors he always looked like a deer watching in the headlights of a car but then when i saw him on a cnbc interview about for instance raising prices and not doing it and and you take the um, altruistic part of his job of of and of Unilever's ambition. I felt he is really in his comfort zone, so maybe he finds it also difficult to balance stakeholders versus shareholders. Just generally, I I, I hope that it's also part of self awareness that he realizes maybe I'm just not up for the job, and this is just you know just one level above my uh, my my capability. Sometimes that happens. That's how he comes across, but. Definitely, I don't find him a good CEO for Unilever. He has not been dealing well with the issues and the cards that he was dealt with. Uh, Paul Polman, I be think before, had a, had a relatively good track record, built his whole company into this kind of a bit of a woke style uh, uh, leadership. But he was partially delivering, let's say, and he did brilliantly with um, the acquisition attempt from, was it 3G Capital at the time? Yeah. yeah. So. If we then look at Alan Yopi, he, he had also difficult topics, but no, he didn't come across convincing. He really feels like an in-between Pope. Yeah, look, I, I think it is some self-awareness from him. He's 59 years of age, so I think if everything was going a little bit smoother for him, I don't think he'd be retiring right now. We'd probably stick it out another another few years, but there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of pressure, particularly after back of that, that failed takeover or failed um and they were trying to buy that segment off gsk yeah. i mean GSK. Just, uh, i think that blew up in his face and i think that's when he kind yeah. of went 
I'm a little bit out of my league here. I'm just going to walk away silently. So yeah, and then um, Ben and Jerry's. Let's not forget, and then an activist investor on the board with Nelson Peltz, who yeah. we know has also at Procter and Gamble uh, really effectively did really well. Also, an Ethiopian. One of his last um, announcements, let's say, was also really appreciative to the experience that they bring on board. So I think. He counted his uh, options already at that time and for like, okay, it's not a battle I, I want to win. And he can leave now via the front door, probably get some flowers from the assistants and the management team. And, you know, and they, 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 they sing a song for him and then he walks nicely out and everyone is happy in, in their mind. But in a British way, they, they get rid of him. From, from my perspective or investor perspective, I mean, I know he's given the end of next year, but I hope it's before that. I hope they bring in somebody sooner than that, at least to sit alongside him, even if he acts as a, a mentor role or, or whatever. But yeah. I do, I do, I don't want to wait, what is it, 13, 14, 15 months for, for the change. I think no. the change has to come sooner than that. This company needs a strong leader. He's clearly not it. And, and dealing with him another one and a half year, knowing that he's going, is probably also not helping the organization with new initiatives, new investments, uh, because he will not own those investments. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good day for us, I think, as investors. And uh, pre-market, even the, the share price went 3% up after the news, right? And I think this is the most, most painful thing as a being a ceo the share price responds to your announcement <laughs> honestly if you put a couple of million in my back pocket i couldn't care less <laughs> I, I, I jump out the door I, the share price could do it at once yeah but exactly I, from from an ego perspective no i agree with you it must be quite tough and that look he must have been aware of it but it's it's the right decision for him and the right decision for for the company and hopefully long term the right decision for for us investors exactly exactly um right so that, that i think that leads us on to our topic quite nicely i mean unilever are now a british company and we've omitted them from our list probably intentionally we, we talk about them quite a lot but with the pound being so cheap i mean i can't remember in history the pound ever being this cheap it's 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 getting quite ridiculous what's going on in the uk i know there's there's lots of people come together they, they've kicked out the government they now brought in somebody new and whatever, whatever they've done it just is not is not working um it seems I, to be a perfect I, storm now yeah and look I, I don't know a whole lot about about politics over there i mean you see stuff in the news every now and again but i i do know that she i think trust I, I don't even know her first name trust is her name but she reduced the tax rate for the most wealthy from 45 down to 40 and forgot about absolutely everybody else <laughs> i thought that was I thought that was pretty brazen of her but i mean for us i think there's a benefit there particularly with the dollar being so strong we can pick up some i, I don't know yeah. i wouldn't say top top quality companies but there's certainly some some good companies there that you could easily hold for the next five ten years yeah so so let's be clear right from a historical point of view this uh the the pound has also been trading like this in 2009 2010 a little bit in 2011 also in 2020 so i think why we're looking at this from a pound point of view is because um it went it became so strong um all the way to the start of the the year and the response to this and the spike to this is really uh, why we are onto this but if you look at it at a five-year history there have been multiple occasions let's say probably 20 percent of the time that actually the pound was trading around these levels yeah. yeah so it's not like something unique as such but the reaction that we're currently experiencing is yeah. really extreme it's it's probably unique in the sense that the dollar is trading so strong and for us uh, in the euro we probably uh, and it probably drop like that we never took as much notice because we always had the dollar yeah. to to fall and we could pick european or us companies now with the dollar so strong it, it probably makes a little bit more sense to look closer to home which is and it's a yeah, combination exactly, of, exactly. of all those and an example of that is i had a re realty income um, order outstanding and it got triggered uh, yesterday and i looked at it and it's so awkward to see on your statement that you paid a certain amount in dollars and that it was more in euros we are used to see it the way around like the yes. dollars and then less euros and in the, yeah. the account statements and that was the opposite i felt like 
well, did I overpay for this stuff, you know, or not? Uh, so this, I had it at the exactly 6% yield as kind of, okay, dollar cost average. So yeah, it, it, it does work mentally a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, it is It is a little bit of a, and I know we, we say we try not to pay too much attention to currencies and it'll fluctuate and, I mean, you'll get the good and the bad, but I mean, when you're in the moment, sometimes it, sometimes it, it is quite hard. Um, but hey, let's start. Let's start. We have five companies to get through. I, I mean, I must I must stress that these are not recommendations. Um, they're, they're companies that we have a, a little bit of an overview of that we like initially, but really to to buy them, it probably needs a little bit more digging into their, their financials. Let's say that we ran them through our screener, but we haven't done a deep analysis. Yes, yeah, for exactly. some of them. Yeah. So what's the well, first I, one then? Uh, let, let's don't keep us so excited. I'll, st I'll start. I'll start. I'll start with a nice, a nice, easy one. It's Ricket Banking, so right. And this is this is a, a consumer goods company. And for our US listeners, you can also buy this. They all, they have an ADR as well, trading on the US exchange. The ticker symbol in the UK is RB, and the ticker symbol for the ADR is RBGLY. So you can buy you can buy them both. Um, they have. Um, you'll be well aware of this company. They 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 have Jurex, which <laughs> which is something we we spoke about. But one thing that actually shocked me about this company is they have a big presence in the United States, which is which is good. We're talking about a strong pound, so that's going to help their revenues and probably pop it up this year. But I, I heard I heard a fact or read a fact that <laughs> that Lysol the product is present you should watch your over. words when we're talking about this company don't use words <laughs> like strong pop it up and, <laughs> and these kinds of things because it's really hard to stay focused <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry i i can't help it but who doesn't have this association it's like lang und Schwarz in, in germany I mean, you can't stay serious around this talk, but let, please go on. I'll try to be uh, to get to get hold of myself. Compose yourself. Compose yourself. There, we'll, we'll talk about we'll talk about our um, other segments first. We'll talk about Lysol, which you used to clean. Good, good, good. Do that. <laughs> which I said is in over half of U.S. homes. I thought that was a pretty in incredible stat. Someone in the U.K. having a product almost in one in two homes in in the U.S. Which is quite good. I do follow this company for my work with Short Dividend, so I do know them quite well. They have released their. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering if you test the products at home as well. Well, uh, I, twice I didn't, <laughs> and I ended up with two kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the results this year have been quite quite good um they have shown an ability to be able to pass on we know inflation is around but they've shown that ability to to pass that on their their like for like sales have gone up both in terms of volume but also in terms of of cost price as well which is which is good to see i, li I like to see that um their health segment went up 24.2 percent their nutrition se segment went up 8.6 percent so you can see that they're, they're basically going nearly above inflation so they're, they're well able to pass that on to to the company um the only really red flag i'd have on the company is the amount of depth that they have but that is due to a takeover so they they took over a company called me johnson which makes baby formula um it's it, to be fair it was a, a good acquisition they are quite active in paying down that depth as well so it's 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 the only blot on it they have consistent dividends I've been paying it i can't remember off the top of my head and when, when i'm analyzing them i analyze them in the us sense so i have to calculate it in, in us dollars and i know that years of dividend growth in us dollars is only one or two years in pounds actually i think it's i think it's more um but i think it's a strong a strong company cold and flu season is coming in which also age growth so i mean it's like a bit of a perfect storm for them cold and flu season is coming in we, we know that goes up in winter and then they have a strong pound which is a strong dollar which is really really going to increase their the revenue and probably over inflate their, their books this year the net effect of that is maybe in two or three years time they'll have a higher basis to work off and it might not look so good but i mean for me consumer staple products that 
are used even in a recession i think that this company is definitely worth looking into and personally they are getting close to a fair, fair value for me as well so you would also consider owning them i would i would consider owning them yeah yeah i i, I re like i think from a brand power point of view i like companies that have strong brands that don't go away too easily um, and, and they have really strong if premium brand power that gives them pricing obviously they, mm. they can increase their prices and also that they can pass this on in inflation it bodes really well from and they've only started as well to tap into the e-commerce market mm -hmm. um and they're, they're growing that quite quickly i think it now accounts to up to 14 percent of their revenue which is which is quite quite something yeah. but they haven't even reached that full potential either so there's there's a lot of a lot of tailwinds there for for the company obviously inflation might hurt it a little bit particularly if people go to cheaper alternatives but i think the brand is so strong you tend like when you're sick you don't want to take a chance on but well, most people i know would not like to take a chance on lesser known tablets yeah. or cold and flu they stick to what they know that works and i think that might might help them yeah Super, super. I wish you lots of luck with that one. If you ever uh, start a position into it, it's a company <laughs> that I can't keep dry eyes with. So it's uh, <laughs> something for me to avoid, I guess. It will be like a pain in my portfolio. You, you just have to ignore the one segment there, and then you'll be absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, All right. OK. So look, uh, British stocks. Why right? there, there is one stock that we have touched upon on uh, in this show as well, and and for me that's British American Tobacco. I've studied a lot. I think regular listeners know that I'm not owning it. I'm not owning tobacco stocks. I did own it, but my wife doesn't agree with me owning tobacco stocks. I mean, I have personally no issues with owning sin stocks, but you know, it's uh, not only my money that I'm investing. It's also her money, and if you are in it together. You would really need to also make sure that uh, you have both accountability for your portfolio right so that's why you know you, there are some trade-offs when you're investing together with your wife or partner whatever it is so that's why i'm not owning it but for me it is just probably the best stock from a valuation point of view in the cigarette industry yeah and in the smoking industry um and I know many people are a fan of Philip Morris, also Altria, also for the dividends. Uh, many people also get in, in, inspired by the American dividend growth community because they naturally tend to look at American stocks. What I just like more about uh, BAT, right, and their acronym is just generally their approach to innovation. I really feel like they have a better agenda better strategy towards the future okay i don't buy their uh building a better tomorrow <laughs> slogan that it sounds a bit too hypocrite but i can imagine when you're an employee that you really start believing this stuff and that's not bad in itself because it triggers a company to really start innovating uh, uh to improve and they talk always about uh, uh in in reduced risk portfolio so it is important to know that they um on both the traditional cigarette brands right like what is it um i believe camel and such uh i don't remember exactly the which the the names but it's important it's that they be. yeah exactly that, that they own those brands but also the new categories like views glow tobacco heating right so fuse is a vapor product tobacco heating glow and then modern oral is philo and these categories are are nicely growing yeah and and there are a few benefits to these categories and why they are growing because they have really some favorable court rulings in the us at the moment as well so for instance they claimed uh with the international trade commission a patent infringement by uh, philip morris and altrias with their iqs uh, products and they they got at least a positive outcome that Philip Morris and Altria are no longer be able to import or sell these IQS products in the United States. Of course, court ruling still going on. Yeah, so this is not a settled case, but at least it is quite beneficial uh, to, to British American tobacco. And it's also a testimony to their innovation and, 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 and what they are investing in, right? Because uh, sometimes we have discussed this in the, in the podcast. I think Americans feel like in Europe, there's an anti-American sentiment towards companies. 
and we have this feeling about your Europe, European companies in the states. Yeah, so yeah. It, it 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 it's not maybe rocket science, but it tells us something. The same also that uh, Jules, one of the companies that uh, <laughs> Altria bought, and I think is still licking the wounds from it with the big write downs that they were doing. Yeah. Um, you know, the FDA banned its products yeah as well um while it allowed e-cigarettes still to be produced by british american tobacco and enjoy so also here uh competition is having a hard time while british american tobacco seems to do pretty well in a very very important market so these are for me typical tailwinds for this company and at the same time they just have a relatively good you know uh balance sheet it's baa1 it's in the lower grade but in the top lower grade here um they have decent uh payout ratio as well eps around in the 70s uh free cash flow in the 50s a low price to earnings multiple around 10 11 and then with a cheaper pound on top of that it just makes this company so much more attractive at the yield of six point uh, let's say six and a half percent uh uh yeah. So, yeah. I mean, for me, it's a company. If you want to have a high yielder, which is nice to own because it's a sin stock. Companies like pension funds often have policies that they can't have these stocks in their portfolio. That's why you get a lower um, price to earnings ratio on top of it. But that's beneficial to us because you get more shareholder yield for your acquisition, hence also a higher dividend yield. And yeah. that's what we invest for, right? As cash flow investors. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, I think from a payout ratio point of view, they are probably the best of the three companies that I know with all three and, and Philip Morris. Uh, all three are up around 80% the last time I checked, whereas these guys trade between 55 and 60% payout ratio. So there's even a lot more growth there from them to be had. What, what I like about these guys is I think they have, a obviously, the, the renovation seems to be more on point, but they also have a stronger hold on emerging markets, I think. And I think that's a big... A big market particularly as emerging markets come into more middle class they, they start looking at brands and i talked about brand power earlier and these guys have it as well don hill bench and hedges hockey strike are the three that i can i can remember off the top of my head which are big big brands i don't smoke but i do know these names because of people around it. um so it's i, I think it's of the three i, I do you know what I, I own more shares than all three probably because i use that for some option trade and i do cover calls and that and i i increase i increase my cash flow with that that way but these guys are probably a better company for me and i probably should flip it i should own more of these than than all three but well you could always try if you believe that the dollar is at a historical strength and the pound at a historical weakness you might benefit from shifting it a little bit right uh, maybe yeah. you get more net dividend income out of the investment now i don't know what the yields are in comparison uh, but also if you then take the dollar translation into it and then the pound yeah you might be better off in the end yeah probably and probably use it for tax harvesting because i think i bought these guys around 30 Ooh, and they're, prob yeah. they're probably in it they're probably less than they're probably yeah. less than 42 dollars so yeah one, yeah one of my one of, one of my favorite companies actually um definitely don't have a big enough position yeah you all i always feel with tobacco stocks you always forget about the innovation so you always think tobacco is going to decline revenues are going to decline but th that's not the case emerging markets is there it's probably going to be 30 40 years before they disappear so plenty exactly. time for me to to rack up those dividend checks and it is vegan right <laughs> hipster yes we got a hipster yeah. company <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to stay on brand power. I, I think I think I've said I, I like companies with strong brands. And the Agio, we spoke about them before. We did a whole episode on these guys before. They have phenomenal brand power. I think they've got 20 of the world's top 100 spirits. I mean, in, incredible. They've also do Guinness, which is made from Ireland, which is which is something I love. But uh, I really like this company. I always feel that they're overvalued and I, I spoke about that and, and actually I ran them through our screener and our screener has them as completely overvalued as well um but it's I think it's a really good company is it recession proof probably not um not as much as the other two companies people do still like to drink and and that but 
you can 100% buy cheaper brands when when times go bad. So that's that's probably the concern I'd have at this moment. I do feel like going into a recession or going into hard times and inflation, we're going to start to see this drop a little bit, I hope. Um, but look, this year, they released their annual results for the previous 12 months, and they grew at 21% in revenue year over year, which was which was quite strong. Um, and pricing mix was 11.1 percent of that so you can see that they are passing on inflation as well um which is obviously quite good to see but i do think that in the recession they will struggle they also have something similar to british american tobacco in the american markets segment again that's a huge segment for something like this because uh, people go into middle class you then don't want to be buying your cheap little beer anymore you want to you want to be seen with your expensive guinness or your smirnoff or, or so on so that's it's that's as catalyst for me as emerging markets recession might hit it a little bit um it's just it's just a matter of valuation that's that's my only issue with this company they do have a little bit of depth on the on the balance sheet as well um which uh, the last time i looked they don't seem to be paying it off as as much as i would like but other than that they have a massive distribution network um they have lots of markets to grow internationally and they got brand brand power so definitely definitely a company to consider it's just a matter of valuation if if you think but may, yeah. maybe with with the pound being so cheap maybe it actually do you mean i i know they were clo close yeah. so maybe that actually they might that might teeter oh, i had to you have to try and stop thinking of the the pound value in isolation and think about it in terms of currency yeah. and then it might balance up a little bit yeah, the, the issue that I have with uh, Diago at the moment is really the price uh, because the share price is really holding up well, right? Even year yeah. to date, uh, uh, compared to last year around this time, it's 8% up. Yeah, so it's really holding well. But if you look at the 2020 crash, it dropped really, really quickly, quite a bit from the top. That that time at three, 35 pounds, right? It dropped yeah. all the way to 25 pounds. So that's like almost a 30% loss. We're not seeing this at all at the moment. Now, it might be that more international investors are buying it now because of a weakening pound. You know, to your point, you get a dividend yield of 2% and a PE ratio of 27. And you know for me it would really need to come down quite significantly i, I but this is a stock i don't want to pay more than 20 pe for really yeah yeah I, I i'm the same and i think the difference in 2020 is everybody knew the pubs were closed everybody yeah. knew that so they yeah. expected expected revenue to drop earnings to drop everything to drop mm -hmm. at the moment i think they only released their full year results maybe a month or two ago and they were quite strong they were really really strong so people reading them and that was maybe a little just a little bit before i know inflation was always on, on tethering around but it was before it really became main mainstream news so i think they kind of went under the radar there they got a little bit lucky in the timing it was strong results just before inflation is is going crazy and they're just taken away but i i do generally think that inflation is going to hit them hard and the recession will kind of hit them so we we could see them around COVID levels and if they do consider me a boy i missed them the last time but i will definitely buy him if they get down that down that low nice 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 good pick so talking then about quality brands uh, as well it's really a bit hard to say that for legal and general so if i i on purpose took a high yield there here uh, like yeah. a really high yield there because you get it at the 8.6% uh, dividend but first of all it's an iconic company it's existing already for what is it 180 years or something like that so really a classic uk company and it's the leading financial services groups and a major global investor um, uh, just because what they own mainly are a lot of pension funds and retirement uh, i guess that the majority of british employees have their retirement with a company like legal and general I don't know if they are also public retirements. I don't know the market well enough. Um, but this is really what the strength is of legal in general. It is also a lot of life insurance, investment management, uh, capital investment. So it's really in this space. Uh, the typical company that gives you an umbrella when the sun shines, but you know, this happens, it probably doesn't happen too often. So maybe people are used to umbrellas in, in, in the UK. 
but from that point of view it is a classic business now the question is is it also a good business for that we would need to do way more analysis but on the surface right they just have a strong earnings uh, they have strong earnings power at the moment um they just let's say the first half year results right they earn 19 pence per share you know on a dividend which is what is it 18 pence per share so just in the first half year they earned already enough to pay out the dividend yeah and and this is what i love about a company that if you only need half a year it means that your payout ratio is probably below 50 percent yeah yeah and and th these are the kinds of that shows you how much strength there is and how much um support there is to buy uh, to pay a growing dividend uh, they also increase the interim dividend with five percent so you know, 5% dividend growth on a stock that is already yielding 8.6%. It doesn't require a lot of imagination to see this company trading at a 10% yield on cost in two, three years from now. Um, what I also like is that in 2016, they changed their policy. It was not a straight way up uh, when it came uh, to dividend policy. This is also why I often refrained myself a little bit with legal in general also uh, you know cutting the dividend in 2008 and 2009 special circumstances they were probably quite close to the blast zone at that time as well but since then they have been like quadrupling their dividend over the over the last decade yeah so it's not just only a high dividend now but it was also supported by a lot of historical dividend growth and i still think they can grow a lot going forward so you know it's meeting my screener criteria it has 12 years of dividend growth a 54 percent payout ratio based on last year earnings and an 8.6 percent dividend yield so it just shows it as a really low pe and i've been always a little bit more fan of chasnara because of its consistency and its um, dividend protection during the great financial crisis legal in general didn't have that However, I changed the dividend policy since then to be more favorable to our investment philosophy of dividend growth. And that's what I like a lot about this company. Um, I don't have detailed knowledge, but it's definitely a uh, company I would one time do a deeper analysis on to see if I really would like to own it in my portfolio as well. And maybe I need to speed it up now with the current uh, uh, opportunity that the pound is giving us. Yeah, nice. I mean, the the only concern you'd have is that they did cut that dividend, but as you said, they, they are now progressive in their dividend policy. So time will tell if 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 that will hold true. Um, but other than that, it does look like a, a decent opportunity. But I'll wait for your detailed analysis before before <laughs> anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Nice, and I'm going to finish it with a different company we talked about probably i'd say quality companies up, up to this point and then now is a company that came across from from your article actually i think you have an article you wrote something about 20 is a 20 stocks and they're called smith and nephew they have a really interesting history i would i would definitely recommend go reading it they were started by a pharmacy and, and he was a nephew of some some businessman um but what i like about the company is the products they're really on the cutting edge of medical care so like in orthopedics they have hip implants and knee implants and they really use technology to boost their products and um, particularly in sports or in sports and many uh, sports medicine they are they're highly active there as well and they also have this advanced wound management which is basically bandages and plasters but they they seem to always have new technology always releasing new products so they're heavily relied on technology they call themselves a medical technology company so I really like him. I ran him through our screener, funnily enough, and it didn't fare out too well. Um, in terms of the depth, actually was quite well, but the revenue growth was in around four to five percent, which is probably what they're expecting this year and next year as well. From what I was reading, their pay ratios are quite high. The free cash flow pay ratio actually was just over a hundred percent, but they've had a bad year last year, and I, I don't know why. If you were to take the average of the previous years, actually that's in around fifty-five to sixty percent. So maybe there was a drop-off pending from COVID or, or something like that. So we need to check that out. Um, earnings per share growth is is low digits as well. So the, the growth it seems to be low and, and steady, but their dividend growth. Well, and what what caught my eye is actually 
they report their dividend in US cents. And if you look at the dividend in US cents, it's it's continuously growing or at least held stable. Um, for their screener, they also report it in pence. And I was taking everything from from their reports in pence and in pounds. So I kept the dividend in pence. And actually in pence, the dividend actually drops, which is quite unusual to see. You normally see it the other way around with these kind of companies. They they hold it steady in their own currency and then which might drop in, in dollars. So they seem more focused on US and getting <laughs> US investors are reporting in US, which is which is quite good. So for for our folks over across the pond in the United States, they're certainly they they have a decent track record in in dividend. Yeah, and they are trading at an eight year slow uh, right now. Do mm. you do you know why the com why the stock is being punished in the stock market right now? No, and, and that's that's one thing I want. To, I mean, I only came across them today, and what really stuck out for me is the products that they have and and the business. I think that's really innovative, and definitely in the future you could see it doing well. I would like to do a deeper dive to just to see why why free cash flow is so low and then why they're getting getting punished. But I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I like these kinds of company, Medtech, yeah, like Medtronic, and and there are a few of those others. Is it Striker? Uh, one of Striker, those companies yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I like those kinds of companies because talking about pricing power, typically, right? As long as you have your patents good and you you do your sales well. I mean, once as a doc, one as a doctor, once you're used to the equipment, you're not likely to advise another product, right? Yeah. So th that's the stickiness of this business. And it, it's I don't I don't know about you, but I know close to home. I know lots of people in their elder years who have played sports, particularly football, mm -hmm. right? particularly football that are using one leg predominantly, have got either their knee done or their their hip done. Yeah. I actually know multiple people that have got their knee and hip done, but as yeah. you said, these are these are the kind of products that that they need, and you can see that happening more and more. And like you said, if if a hospital if they get in with hospitals and doctors and they say right, use this product, we know how much of an, a monopoly that can be, and, and that's what you're getting. Exactly. So it, it it certainly it, it's sparking my interest. That's that's what I would say. Um, yeah. And one I want to do a little bit more research on, and maybe some of our listeners might might know some. They might drop some comments about this company that they might know a little bit more about it than us super so guys five companies here these are five companies that met our screener criteria uh weakening pounds do your own homework do some analysis uh but yeah we really wanted to share this as inspiration because we know it's in many people's minds and also with that entered our minds and uh, we've got some homework to do as as well but i hope this is a good starting point yeah Hey, having said that, let's go to the next section. And we have a volunteer again for portfolio. Yeah, we have Rafa. And we, we know Rafa quite well. And he's submitted his portfolio. So he's gave us his top 10, which makes up roughly about 30%, 29% of his portfolio. We've got Intel at the top, 4.3. 4, uh, We've got Bristol Myers at 3.9. We've got BAM at 2.99. Unilever. 2.91 and BlackRock makes up the top five. And in number six, then he's got uh, the All World ETF as well. Um, so he's he's covering all bases. Um, if we look, his biggest sector is I mean, it seems quite good, cool, but his biggest sector is consumer staples at 18, healthcare 14, and he's got financial and information technology coming up in the next two positions. So, what are your thoughts looking at his portfolio initially? Well, first of all, four of the tickers start with a B. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that's, that's the first thing that I observed is BMI, BAM, BLK, and BAT. And generally, let's say it like that. If 28% is your top 10, you have a strong diversification, at least from a position point of view. And he mentioned that 60 stocks because my 10, top 10% 10 or my top 10 is probably 50% of my portfolio. So I'm more concentrated. Right? Um, he mentioned also that he started investing in stocks in 2020. And for me, this is visible. Like last week, uh, yeah, it is visible. Um, by the way, uh, Con Conrad, last week he reached out also on Facebook. He mentioned like some of those, like GIS, they were like really good picks at the bottom of yeah. uh, 2020. But here, I, I think if Intel is your top position, 
for me, it's a turnaround play less than a dividend growth stock, although it has a dividend growth track record, right? That is favorable. Um, the same feeling uh, I have with Fresenius in this portfolio. I have a little bit the same feeling with CVS as well. Unilever even has not been, it has, it has not been the best performing stock. So again, these sound like stocks all that gave a decent yield over the last two years. Yeah. but might not be of the highest quality and that's kind of my concern a bit with this portfolio that it is lacking some really high quality in here but that really depends on the opportunities that that we might be presented with but also for for this one i would really recommend to focus a bit more on high quality stocks if the opportunity pre presents itself and i believe texas instruments is such a high quality stock currently at an attractive starting yield um yeah this is my first observation when i look at the portfolio yeah i mean he, he has got blackrock which which i would consider top quality and he's also got the vanguard or world etf to, to balance mm -hmm. it out so he's, he's yeah. got a lot of diversification there is some quality in there bristol myers as well well, well i would not say it's in the, the top tier I, I still think that has that has lots mm -hmm. of potential but but you're right it does it does seem like a lot of it was bought in 2020 you can see why these make up and i'm guessing yeah. he has 60 60 stocks and he, he's mentioned himself maybe due to lack of conviction so i maybe he has got some other high quality stocks just not making up enough of the portfolio but i mean for for a portfolio that's two years old i think the diversification is pretty impressive it's a lot yeah. more diversified than, than mine it seems Pretty good. But is it diversified fun. by design or is it by diversified by a lack of strategy and just gobbling up everything you come across on the internet yeah. and articles about it? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But Rafa can can tell us that one. But I, I, I would agree. I would I would probably try and reduce my exposure in Intel and real turnaround plays, make them maybe your two percent and take yeah. a company like BlackRock or Microsoft or any 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 number of companies up. At, at a higher exactly. level. But, but I do I do like the diversification. I think the diversification is is good. And I think actually for for some investors, particularly if you're nervous about conviction, maybe having an over diversified portfolio, it's like an ETF is probably a good idea. Because if, if you yeah. don't have that conviction yourself, spreading the risk is probably the best thing to do because it'll help you not to panic if things go south. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and there are strategies of uh, the people employ, and I think Alan uh, from Sweden is, is one of that. They just say everything at a certain yield, so many years of growth, decent payout ratio, I buy it. And they feel totally fine as uh, owning 100 uh, companies. And it's it's still a better thing to do if, if you don't mind the time managing it than an ETF, because with an ETF, you don't have the luxury of taking your entry price, entry price of every individual stocks so if you then have an etf that is paying you two or three percent while you could put your entry price always at four percent then yeah you might still be better off than doing an etf because that would be the case as well right if you have 60 stocks why not be an etf why not yeah. buy an etf at that time yeah. and actually he has he has mentioned intel is due to some options assigned as well so maybe that wasn't intentional and it was just trying to grab the premium then and then he's followed my path into holding a company forever because it's after losing half a share price um but yeah look i i think i think for a two-year-old portfolio i see a it's lot of resemblance good. Yeah, yeah i see a lot of it's resemblance to, to what i would have done as well um around yeah. those times as well so yeah i think you're same on the here. right path same in, here in yeah. yeah yeah same here good awesome so we move on to the listeners questions there we have quite a few to get through so we'll try and zip through some of these um morris has asked us why only add quality stocks now why not mix some sin stocks to create a bigger snowball uh, it is effectively a, a prolongation on what we just mentioned um it was easier to buy sin stocks and such over the last two three years so i feel like my portfolio is a little bit shifted towards stocks with a story and i need to rebalance a little bit and i've been always waiting for this opportunity now that the opportunity is coming or or arising i want to remember what i was always regretting over the last two years as well so it's really about balancing the portfolio um some sin stocks 
uh, sorry, to create a bigger snowball. I think we just mentioned like British American tobacco as an example. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm against it. And actually, um, there's a good case for it to do it uh, even because high yield is also, of course, important. But um, I would say high quality and high yield would be a better combination. Yeah. I, I would look at risk, isn't it? It's, it that's what it boils yeah. down to. It boils yeah. down to risk. And you remember, it's easier to invest in a turnaround company when you have low interest rates, but are paying little to nothing on their debt. You've got no inflation. You've got no real headwinds. Everything is about growth, and the market is primed for growth. Consumers are buying. So it's a lot easier to buy turnaround companies at that moment. You look in this moment, you have a completely different scenario. You've got high interest rates, high inflation. Consumers may now start retracting and not buying as much. That means laptops are real consumer discretionary items will now suffer. So which companies do you think are most likely to cut a dividend? The share price is probably going to be hammered across all, but we're income investors. Which ones do you think will be most, most likely to cut? And it's really going to be that, those dividend um yeah. those dividend those ones that are a little bit more at risk um so likes of intel i would not be surprised to see a small dividend cut there considering the pressures they're under the market shares behind they're trying to catch up they need money for r d they need money to build prefab prefabs and, and so on so that's why i think quality is important it doesn't mean you don't have to buy any of the other companies and and i would argue british american tobacco could be considered Maybe not high quality. A high quality, maybe not the highest quality, but I still think it is a yeah. quality company. So it depends on your your definition of that as well. But exactly. I think r risk is risk is the big thing. Yeah. Good. The next question is from Paul Armstrong, um, and he he's asking about with the yields rising across the board, is there a point to increase bond holdings or corporate debt uh, instead of dividend stocks? look that there always is <laughs> everything has a price i think you mentioned six percent if it got if it got up to double figures it'd be a no-brainer really like but i mean it's it's hard to know as i said it's not an area that i'm most strongest in so i would probably have to be tentative in it and then by the time i'm probably comfortable we're probably in the reverse situation so it's, it's um, <laughs> yeah that, that's my take good then Alex is asking if we have ever considered railroad companies or airport, company, airport companies as investments. Yeah, I think there's quite strong railroad companies in Canada and the US. I think Canadian Pacific is, is one in particular that I looked at. Um, I mean, these, these guys have, we talk about a strong moat. There's nobody coming in taking over them. We know railroads are, are I wouldn't say a dying trade, but whatever's there is there and you're not going to get new companies coming in so that they're quite safe um the problem i had at the time was around valuation they were quite richly valued because of that reason <laughs> they had they had that competition all sold up um but I, I still think it's an interesting if you can get them cheap enough i think it's it's very interesting at that airport companies i don't think they have the same as as railroad i mean we know there's lots of airports out there I don't think it's as tied down as, as railroad, so maybe not so much then, but I would love to own Canadian Pacific as, as an example. Yeah. Good. Um, Boris has asked us, can you recommend any ETF with good dividend growth from the UK or Netherlands? Um, not as such, but I can put the link to uh, an article that uh, about dividend ETFs, uh, European accessible to Europeans in the show notes, uh, Boris, and have a look at it. Um, because you ask with good dividend growth record from the UK or the NL, I don't know if you mean UK stocks or NL stocks or with an ISI N code in the UK or an NL, um, because they are relatively okay dividend growth etfs that are having a, a whole world scope or maybe an american scope or maybe maybe emerging markets um i studied some of them so i'll put the link in the show notes and then you can uh, actually assess it yourself because it's not clear enough for me from this question yeah he's, he's also asked about dlr and there's another question about about those guys as well yeah and um, they look very nice with a five percent yield 
Um, I think it's a company you know a little bit more. About. Yeah, yeah. So I looked at it from an uh, funds from operations point of view. I studied it, and in my opinion, the uh, fair value of of a company like digital, um, I said, realty trust. Yeah, and it's maybe important to mention we're talking here about cloud centers the data centers for the cloud that they are building and owning and facebook and the likes are their um i said their customers and my fair value is 100 bucks and it's now trading below that so it means that it is in the fair value zone they have 17 years of dividend growth about five percent dividend yield their funds from operations have not been growing a lot so i've been therefore also really uh conservative in my assessment because i'm lacking a little bit of strength um, from the company and i don't understand that so what i don't understand is that this is a booming industry we have seen a decade of of cloud investment and even um you know exponentially growing in the in the till of the last few years and i don't see this uh going back to the bottom line of the company and i'm not able to answer the question why this is maybe they don't have a lot of pricing power maybe their portfolio uh, means that they are dealing with the tech giants in the world and therefore they have little negotiation room i don't know but still taking this all in consideration i think it's trading now at a fair value i probably would like to see this with a 10 10 15 percent margin of safety uh, i might be wrong so consider me uh, a buyer at 85 was good to know i bought a really really small entry position at 150 dollars like a year or two ago just to see it in my portfolio but yeah around 85 i'll probably buy a bit more cool um zandor has asked us about your thoughts on alliance i think we have a couple of questions and um, they have quite a high yield at the moment yes uh definitely actually i put a buy order out so um and i did it today what a coincidence i put a buy order at 154 euro and 28 cents and why that's exactly seven uh, percent uh, yield <laughs> for me it's a medium to high quality company um management didn't look too good initially with the uh with the pension what was it the pension funds and the teachers in america where they effectively in my my opinion committed some uh, uh let's say maybe not fraud but some sh really shady behavior uh, in march 2020 however afterwards they have managed well with it i would say and it is just a, a good company and i think even an increasing interest rate environment this company should do fairly well so yeah um let's hope that i can buy another one another set at seven percent yield so definitely i like it at this price and this is one of those things that i see as a high quality company in europe and um, the next question then we have is from marek and he is asked do you think robotics can be a big thing um he's looking at someone like in uh, what is it intuitive surgical um as a dividend pair i really think robotics could be huge definitely a work in automation I, I i can see what's going on i did some studies in when i was in college as well uh, my thesis was was around robotics and the, the growth exponentially in in the number of applications using robotics has grown and that was maybe six years ago now and i could imagine in the last six years that's probably even quadruple at that stage so i do think robotics plays a huge part in our future which ones are dividend pairs i don't know i don't i don't i've never heard of intuitive surgical uh, I, I know companies like um schneider abb um kuka and stuff like that so they're the companies that i that i use and i focus on but i definitely think i really honestly think that 10 years from now robotics will play a huge part particularly maybe i, I did work on a, a project before i went to my my current job and it was in a meat plant and it was in like a, a freezer a big huge freezer and i mean it was so cold and there people had, could only go in there for 45 minutes do what they had to do and then go out warm up and then go back in but the project that that i was on at the time was that they were going to replace something like 15 20 people per line they had 10 lines with just one robot on each line and it'll pack and do all so then you don't need <laughs> automatically you don't have the overheads of 10 people you have a robot that can stay there for 24 hours a day packing and a lot more throughput so i think 
I think a lot of jobs like that, a lot of mundane jobs, a lot of dangerous jobs will will now move to robotics over time. And I think it's I think it will be a huge, huge player. Yeah. Super. Uh Miwash Markovic. Um he's asking about our thoughts about Qualcomm. Uh, and he feels like uh, we it's it's often overlooked and he feels like it's in the Texas Instruments League. Uh, what's our take? It's a big a big claim, <laughs> I would say. Um, he's he's right, and it's often overlooked because I usually do. I don't think they've ever met my screeners and and anything yeah. before, so I've 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 always left them. But certainly, if it's in the Texas Instrument League, then I'm I'm missing out. But I'm I'm not quite sure from 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 what I read online and from my other takes. I don't think they have the same quality. So I I almost bought them once when they were yielding four percent, like four or five years ago. And they had a big dispute with Apple at the time. I don't know if you remember that. And that Apple was saying like, okay, uh, Qualcomm, uh, uh, you're, you're charging too much for the chips. And if you continue like this, we'll, we'll take our own path. Well, we have seen also Apple taking their own path since then. Um, and it was really, really a huge conflict at the time. I think they wanted to go to court. That was the reason why I didn't buy them at the time. In hindsight, it was uh, me lacking guts. Yeah, I might. Uh, it would have been a good decision to buy them. Um, I sometimes still actually regret that because Qualcomm is a relatively good managed company, uh, but now it's just not hitting my screener criteria again as such, um, like it used to do. And I'm still a little bit, I guess, anchored in the story from those times where I felt like, hmm, it shows a lot the uh, sensitivity to their revenue. And yeah. hence also why I didn't take an effort anymore really to also really dive into it. That's yeah. my uh, yeah. Yeah, answer. I, 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 I quickly put them into to my screen. I use Kaifin, which is good. Mm -hmm. I have custom. Look, it looks it looks decent. The only the only thing I can see is free cash flow is a little bit choppier than, than what I would like. But that seems minimum minimal dividends obviously is quite strong um revenue is quite strong gross margin is in around 65 percent. so no they look decent enough good 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 so then the next question is from chago and he's asking uh, us what is our uh what are our thoughts about t row price so if we look at Tiro Price, I like it. I really like this company. He said also he just opened a position and he would like to confirm his bias. So confirmed. I, I, I have to say, I look forward to Tiago's newsletter every Sunday. It's really, really high quality. I might not always agree with everything he says, but you can you can see the research that goes in behind it. You can see his thoughts. He, he doesn't just follow the crowd he gives these actual own thoughts just critical thinking behind it and i always learn something from it um and i i quite agree with your your thesis um uh, what, what attracted me to the company initially was very low debt uh, increasing revenues increasing dividends it seemed like a really really well well-run business um my issue or my concern would be the same as his in terms of we are now hitting a recession and we know that these types of of companies will, will struggle but it also presents a buying opportunity and and good run companies like t-row price will be buying up particularly in recession for opportunities to to grow their assets and and grow their investments so i, I do think it's a it's a well-run company they are pretty nicely priced in dollar terms <laughs> maybe not when we when we convert but um i started to buy them slowly as well um one or two shares every i I, I guess with t row price so it's all in green right generally what i think is also here it's a bet on us and as investors in t row price that the stock market will continue to be popular in the next 10 years and that more and more people are joining the stock market i think this is also really important because we also hear more and more news or you know pundits saying like we might have a decade long like flat decade a lost decade yeah. right this might also withdraw people from the stock markets maybe interest rates will be higher that people start saving money again so i think this is kind of the risk for me not so much recession risk but we have seen 
the golden age probably of investing in the last 10 years yeah with the popularization the emerging markets uh, getting an increasing middle class and not show not saying that those are the clients necessarily of tiro price directly but this whole sentiment of investing uh, has been growing so your bet with this is also that the continue can the company can continue growing like this I see more risk to that compared to what we have seen in the last 10 years. But I am uh, a fan of this company. Yeah, I think there's definitely more risk. Uh, we we haven't seen panic yet. We saw a panic in 2020 with COVID. We, we saw lots of panic there, but we haven't seen as much panic, even if you no know, growth stocks are down. I think if the S&P keeps, keeps dropping and keeps dropping, we, we could probably see a little bit of panic towards the end of the year, maybe the start of next year. But look, I, I, I don't think the stock market's going away. History has shown that even 10, 15 years, if, mm. if these guys are around in 15 years, then I think the returns will be there. So it's just, if, if you're betting on the stock market, then look, that's what we do every day. So <laughs> why, <laughs> why not why not trust these guys to do it for us? Well, I think um, uh, you also need to look at the beer case when you're investing, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Stubbats, and I actually don't know. He, he asks us questions uh, often, but I'm still wondering what does it stand for. But anyway, uh, he is interested in our thinking about the currency changes, the US stocks, the S&P 500 falling 24% year to date, but it's mostly offset by a euro that also declined 15% year to date and the British pound 21% year to date. So in the, in the end, did we really benefit from it as European investors? I guess that's the question. And then how we think about US stocks at the moment. Yeah, I, I think we kind of answered that inherently through, throughout the show. Probably the topic was based on a cheap pound. Probably we saw quite a few questions around currency, so probably inspired a little bit by that. Um, in terms of currency US stocks, as I said, usually I don't don't think about it. Usually I don't, but like you said, after you purchase something and you see a higher dollar, a higher euro amount, it, it, it does lend you to think that you've overpaid. Um, maybe I will start trying a little bit more with European, but but you know, it depends. <laughs> I always say I'm going to focus on European. I'm going to focus on this, but then it just depends what's in the market at the time I'm buying. I dollar cost average in every every month. Markets change quite quickly. Everything changes. So at the at the moment, I'm probably going to add a little bit more British American tobacco, um, and then look into some of the the other UK stocks that we mentioned mentioned above, rather than than US stocks. But then at the same time, I like them dollar cost averaging in on T Row price is one at the minute and Texas Instruments as well. So uh, probably a little bit, a little bit of both. Okay. Um, we had another question on DLR, which we answered. Uh, Jacob has asked us another question along along the lines um, about U.S. stocks seem cheap in U.S. dollars. So, how are you going about dollar cost averaging in in there? Yeah. So, although I'm, uh, I mentioned early in the show, like, oh, it feels so expensive, expensive. But that's also what I'm doing. I'm just trying to ignore it. I can't time the market. So hence why I put stocks like Realty Income at a, how you say it? Uh, just with an order, yeah, like a, an outstanding order for the next month. I know that I would like to own it at 6%. So I just put it like that. I know that it was expensive. It's unfortunately like that. But I don't know if, if the dollar will be next year on 80 cents to the euro, right? I really, really don't know. We don't know where the bottom is of this. We don't... I mean, we don't know if this is just the early days of the trend uh, here. So I really, really don't know. And we are anchored around a certain currency. Um, it is true that at the same time, I'm, of course, looking also for opportunities at the pound at the same time, or even the euro or the Polish lotty, right? So it is. it does influence me. I, I, um, I can't ignore it totally. But at least for those high-quality stocks that I want to have, I don't try to be extra picky now because i really don't know what the direction of the dollar will be maybe this is a pivotal moment in 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 like history that we will see now that american dollar becomes so strong because of them actually you know knowing when to stop printing aggressively inter increasing interest rates and we are here in europe just not able to make any decision 
and therefore just weakening our global position also with what's going on in russia ukraine we don't know yeah so that's my point here cool um weights has asked us do you know a small cap polish company called mobrook so I looked it up, weights, and honestly, I don't know it. Uh, you mentioned it's in the waste management industry, also does some dividend growth. So, but I looked it up. I don't know it at all, and I c really can't see say anything meaningful here. I also like to mention here that I'm a bit withholding giving an opinion as well because with Defama, I put a tweet out, which is also a small cap in Germany. And suddenly the price hiked the day after because others started buying it as well, I guess. And the CEO even pinged me on Twitter because he's on Twitter as well, like with some recommendation about being on social media around small caps because they have so little volume, maybe 10 trades on a day. So anything I say, I, I want to watch out a little bit with that. Hey, you're kind of a big deal now. <laughs> you can you can move it. You can move. No, but even if you put it on on no, Twitter, I, I if I'm just talking. ten people just... start buying the next day. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I'm only playing. Um, MB has asked us, what are your criteria for searching for stock, and what valuation models are you using? Two point seventy five percent minimum yield, at least um, a dividend growth of a decade, or let's say even more, 13 years, that it shows that it was not cut during the Great Recession or during COVID times. Um, and uh, how I say it, a decent payout ratio. So let's say below 70%. With this, I have at risk that I exclude some companies that, for instance, just started recently paying a dividend with lots of dividend growth potential. Um, but if you ask me what I put in a, a screener, then that's it. And the valuation model is like cash is king, free cash flow, uh, funds from operations. Yeah, that's really it. Some exceptions for in insurance companies like net income because free cash flow is meaningless there. But it needs to be the the in, in, in the income statement or free cash flow statement. I would like to see the most stable one focused on cash, no adjustments. Um, we'll keep moving on <laughs> we have quite a few questions uh, Jeff has asked us any consideration regarding BP versus ExxonMobil um, BP has a future plan for alternative energy sources while ExxonMobil seems to be out for the black gold well you know I study oil companies a lot um, Jeff there is a video go to my YouTube channel uh, not too long ago maybe a month ago or something like that where I compared the oil majors I did a whole refreshment of analysis and you will see that uh, ExxonMobil scores really good from a balance sheet point of view BP scores really good from a valuation point of view these two are um, ideally in sync with each other but they aren't so have a check there. Uh, I generally agree with the narrative of uh, ExxonMobil a bit more in denial and probably influencing American politics more to squeeze out all the black oil. I also see ExxonMobil as a company that in the end would just buy one of those new energy sources and, and, and the ones that has proven it, maybe even overpay a little bit for it, while BP is more like on a discovery path, I would say. But for instance, imagine that BP finally nails it i wouldn't be surprised if ExxonMobil just snoops up bp at that time and scales it to a global level i mean this is how it goes yeah yeah you could you could definitely see them they're not going to sit around forever um but i think they will stay with oil for as long as it's profitable so they'll play exactly then dividend and good schrift ask if we have ever discussed ticker symbol lyb and i believe it is it lion based basel something like that yeah yeah i think we did, did we do an episode on them i'll mention them somewhere mm -hmm. we, we we have done some on them um i think they're a decent company i think we had constant concerns around the dividend safety because they have caught it before this is a company that nearly went bankrupt before as well or they did go bankrupt um so that there was quite some concerns there um by all accounts they've <laughs> remodeled the management is better they have now actually prioritizing the dividend but it's still hard to look past what what happened i think it was about 10 10 12 years ago um so i haven't looked at them in in a long time i think i'd rather for a chemical company someone like bass f at, at the moment 
Um, we have dividend yogi. Uh, do you think Allianz dividend sustainable? We've I think you've we put in a buy order, it. so yeah, yeah we, we've already spoke about that. Um, any opinion on Deutsche Post? No, no, but I was asked to uh, analyze it um, the other day, so it's on my watch list to do something with it and to to analyze it. Okay, and the last question is from Jan, and he has asked us. He's got some equities that are up twenty five percent from his cost price, um, which gives him a relatively lower dividend yield, I suppose. Um, would you consider selling them and buying some high yielders? I mean, oh, this is the good old question about opportunity costs. Opportunity costs, right? Um, I have the, I've had this thought so often around Microsoft. Like, why don't sell half of Microsoft and buy high yielders? Um, yeah, I mean, I did this in the early days of my investing. I I sold McDonald's at hundred twenty dollars, which I had an entry price on ninety dollars, thinking like. Oh, it went up. Maybe I should sell it. There are all better alternatives out there. Um, and I so regret. Yeah. So uh, my my learning just generally over time is cut your losers quick and let your winners run. When I say losers, I don't mean this with share price, but something like General Electric, Tupperware, these kinds of companies. You see it coming that the dividend safety is at risk. You don't even need to wait for a dividend cut. If all all signals are red in your screener that's a moment you maybe want to consider selling them already and look at alternatives i've done the same with disney cut the loser quickly like straight away and with shell we did an assessment and it was not a loser as such but we lost on our dividend income right so no i'm not set i'm not doing this game it's so attractive it's so attractive but i think my portfolio would have been looking with a much lower quality if i would have been doing that maybe not worth the few percent additional dividend income in return for that yeah and i have to agree with john his, his last line to us was doing nothing is the most difficult thing about investing and we know everyone says do nothing and, and but it is actually quite hard sometimes so i i get it we get this question quite a bit and look i think we we've all done it at some point sometimes it might work out sometimes it won't um, yeah. just th think about the companies you you want to sell and do you really want to sell them just so i think sometimes the best would be right just to transfer automatically funds from your salary you know to your account uh for the full year just put 12 buy orders in for the year at certain prices and then give uh, give the password to someone who will to your investing account not knowing it's from your investing account and then um, don't write it down for yourself so that you don't remember it make it a difficult one such one suggested by google chrome or something like that with all the hexadecimals and then tell them and give it with christmas and tell them to only give this password again with christmas next year i think this this would be the best because then you know you can't log in you can't look at it you know your buy orders you know what you wanted to buy the company the likelihood that you regret your buy orders because the company is suddenly going really really down in the sense of fundamentals is probably low if you do your homework before if you're lucky lucky all your 12 buy orders get hit if you are not maybe five or six you'll invest the cash then with christmas next year sometimes feel like this is the best approach right that that sounds so easy yet so hard at the same time so <laughs> good luck yeah i know i know but this <laughs> me just daydreaming yeah cool um thanks again everyone for all the questions we we managed to fit them all in um we do appreciate everyone interacting on facebook on twitter on online everywhere so thanks for all your questions and all your interactions and with that we will see you all next week